Hello everyone, I'm Chucky2009. I am here with the one and only Miss Sydney. She has hired hundreds of welders throughout her career. And uh, so we're going to be talking about uh, various soft skills, various things that are good to know if you're trying to get a welding job. I guess a lot of this is fairly universal, but since literally hiring welders is her background, we're gonna tailor this more towards welders and tradesmen. Uh, some basic interview skills, some resume skills, which in, in hindsight, once you know them are kind of obvious, but a lot of people don't. So if you figure this stuff out beforehand and you do what she says, you'll be putting yourself ahead of a lot of other applicants and all sorts of other things. So uh, what would you like to begin with? I think it's like a lot, you know, we'll start with resumes. I think that's kind of like how you get your foot, in, how you get the interview anyways, right? So um, I guess a couple pieces of advice for resumes that I would suggest um, is every resume is different and every recruiter kind of has like their own preferences. Um, I'm just going to kind of hit on stuff that I dealt with in particular, what makes it easier for me. Um, I screened thousands and thousands of resumes before and the, the biggest thing you have, like I think it's a standard of four seconds to jump out to a recruiter. So the way to do that quickly and easily, um, a couple of things is number one, put your education at the top. If you're looking for a job, people are going to assume that you've gone to trade school in some form or fashion, whether that's for HVAC, CNC machinist, or a welder, most people have been in some kind of education format to back that up. So I always encourage people to put their education at the top because that's the first thing I'm looking for is to see your education usually dictates what kind of job you're trying to get. Um, and so that would be one big thing. The other thing uh, that I would mention is to bulletize your stuff. Um, nobody really has time to read through paragraphs and paragraphs of stuff. Um, so I always tell guys to keep it really short and simple. There's a couple websites that I refer our students to that will help kind of bulletize. So if you go online, do your basic Google search on writing a resume, there's going to be a lot of uh, sites out there that'll kind of help you bulletize and try to think of stuff that, you know, in your last job that maybe you didn't think about. Um, and the third thing that I would always recommend is putting whatever your job title that you're trying to get, whatever the, the job title that you're applying to, whether it's a welder or a machinist or um, an electrician, you know, that word needs to be in the first three inches of your paper when you're filling out it when on your resume. Because that's, <laughs> it's so hard sometimes to figure out, especially if you're new. Um, our students, you know, as they're graduating, a lot of them never had jobs welding mm -hmm. before, so they don't really have that word in there because there's n it's not in their experience at all, which is totally normal. Um, so you want to put that in there somewhere. Uh, the template that I give our students, it has their name at the top and right under it. It says AWS Certified Welder because they are, and that's the kind of job they're trying to get. So those would be three really key pieces of information that I would put on a resume to kind of help you stand out and get through the recruiting process faster. Definitely. They told us when I was in high school, we had a teacher who uh, was, I think, very good at creating resumes. He gave us a few pieces of advice. One, as Sydney said, she is screened thousands and thousands of resumes make yours physically stand out go to like I, I remember being in trade school with next to no money but still go to Home Depot spend like seven bucks on some thicker paper with a real nice heavy-duty feel to it if you're if you really want to go all out perhaps you'll consider using a computer program to put like an orange stripe down the side or something as a, as a decorative thing and the other thing is Make sure things, I mean, this is, this is, should be obvious, and I know for like almost all you guys it is, make sure things are spelled right and the grammar is at least somewhat decent. Look, guys, I'm not an English major. I've gone on full-on rants before with my friends and stuff about, you know, like I'll be looking for a specific piece of machinery online or a specific tool, and there's a listing that I don't see because they spell it wrong. Well, I can't spell everything right, but the name of the machine is literally on the machine and people still get it wrong in the list. Like go th spell check that stuff, <laughs> make sure it's discernible because like I understand, you know, they're hiring a welder, not, you know, a proofreader or whatever. But, you know, for my very limited experience hiring people, which is a microscopic fraction of Sydney's, even I would be like, look, if you can't figure this out and you're not willing to make a small amount of effort to get this right, you know, what's it going to be like when I tell you something that you need to do that maybe you haven't done before? But I know you can figure out if you don't care about this, you're not going to care about that. Yeah, absolutely. Resumes, keep it simple. All There's a lot of fluff. There's a lot of like squiggly lines and like all these crazy formats out there find something simple and easy to read you have four seconds like keep it to one page even if you've had you know 30 years of welding experience really people are only looking for the last 10 years of your work experience anyway so you should be able to fit all that on one page if you're if you can't you're probably putting too much in there anyways so keep it simple and keep it 
clean and pretty. Um, I always think it's great to have a place for skills, so things that maybe you don't have or didn't get um, a formal education on, like maybe your last job you were forklift certified or um, you have a CPR certification, first aid, something like that. Those extra kind of certifications and whatnot, uh, a place to have those undocumented uh, skill sets. If you worked at a job that was kind of under the table, which a lot of people have done, I worked for my stepdad over the summer in construction, that construction experience is super important and super valuable, but where do I put it if, I have, if it was under the table? You know, so you, having a place for your skills is a, is a great place to list stuff like that. Uh, if you were an Eagle Scout, I loved Eagle Scouts. Those are always uh, really well-rounded workers. Um, so that's another great place. But most people are like, I don't really know where to put that. And they put it under education, but it kind of gets missed, especially if your education is at the bottom. So putting that, having a place for your skill sets that maybe are um, not some kind of formal education, certification, something like that, would be a, that would be another good thing to have on your resume as you're looking for a template. Uh, I would definitely look for something that has a place for your skill sets. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we're going to be talking about marketing oneself to get closer to the interview process. Yeah, Mar it's a super, it's a really big part of um, of the industry now, and it's a really big part of getting a job is really being able to sell yourself and who you are to an employer or um, and really anybody you meet. Uh, I took a really cool class at Emory recently on um, graphic design and one of the things we talked about was uh, branding and what branding is uh, and by the definition branding is your promise that you make to your customer right so if you buy an Apple product you have a certain level of expectation based on their brand of how good the products gonna be uh, and it's just no different than yourself right how you look and how you dress is the same thing as what an iPhone looks like feels like how heavy it is how well does it perform it's all kind of the same thing it's it's branding 101 and it, it uh, seamlessly translates to your physical person so if you think about the fact that you're a walking advertisement what are you projecting on to your potential either employer or the interviewer uh, that's sitting there so it could be like a hiring manager or something like that so think about those things it's the way you dress are you, do you look clean? <laughs> do you look dirty? Um, I always tell our students, you know, they know you're coming to work. They know you have a trades, you know, they know you're going for skilled labor, which is awesome. Um, you're needed in the country more than ever before. But there's also a level of like hygienic soundness that is important. So um, I always tell guys a button down shirt and jeans is totally fine. Yeah, butt down shirt, a polo, guys have it really easy. This is how the cool kids always dress, just FYI. <laughs> All the cool kids. <laughs> uh, right? <'Cause, laughs> yeah, actually. Right? Yeah. Okay. So um, a button down shirt or a polo is awesome. I think that keeps it really simple. But as I tell our students, you better have your gear in the car, right? You better have your gear in the car. You better be able to weld. I know we mentioned that in the last video. Being prepared is super important. Having your resume, having a copy when you walk in, just in case. Starting the interview with a handshake and some eye contact is crucial. And that sets the tone for the rest of the interview. So keep those things in mind as you're starting through the interview process. But even before you get there and you drop off your resume, that girl in the front counter or guy, um, is that's your first impression. So when you set that resume down, whether you're having a good day or a bad day, that person should never know. You should be as polite and courteous because that's your first, that's your first impression, right? And you only get one first impression. So that person, you never know what their clout is with the hiring manager. People have heard that, but I don't really know if they believe how, how true that is. Um, I have, I've experienced that many times when people have dropped off resumes to the office. You know, if they were rude, trust me, we remember, we know, we've made a note, we've made a mark somewhere, we know if you're not polite. So those are all part of keeping your own personal brand out there and keeping it clean, you know? Definitely. To add to this a little bit, I would say, and again, I know this is really review, but I'll wish I'd said this if I hadn't. If you're gonna email anyone at the company or email in a resume, Make a mental note of what exactly your email address is. This is something they told us in high school. If your email address is like weedballer420 at gmail.com, free email, so take five minutes and make another email. <laughs> Just be like Joseph Stevens, 1997 or, or something. Just figure it out. Don't be sending professional emails that way. Likewise, you know, people will 
get on get on Facebook especially and and stalk you. I know last time I hired someone, I pretty much anyone I seriously considered that was one of the first things that I did. I took all these names, I took phone numbers, I looked these people up on Facebook, and some of them did not progress because of that. You know, I mean, you have to decide where this line is. You know, if there's if there's drugs in it, if there's if there's nudity. I mean, all this get rid of that stuff. Clean clean up everything, and if you can't, just del delete the whole page. Do not sabotage your chances, especially if if like you know. I know a lot of you guys are trade school age which in, in most cases is after high school if you if you hit it really hard in high school and you were one of the one of the party kids or whatever but you're really trying to to get your life together and start a career do not let that stuff hold you back get rid of that stuff assume they're going to go looking for it and if you have an email address like that i mean we we all had some pretty awkward teenage years most of us make another one yeah absolutely <laughs> i'm I, sure you have some stories to tell oh so yeah I, yeah it's a very <laughs> see it happens a lot unfortunately i've actually rescinded a job um, yeah. from somebody based on the fact that um his name got out to after he was hired his name got out to some of his future you know co-workers and they looked it up and saw some really offensive things um in the position that we were putting him in it's we can't tolerate that so i mean it's no different with a welder if you're working with a team, like you're gonna have people from all over, all different types of folks working on a team together, they need to know that you can do that. So that's super important. Um, I always tell our students to view your profiles as a public person, like log in as, I don't know, make some kind of fake login, look at your stuff, have a friend look at your stuff. Um, and look at it and see, decide, you know, I need to probably make that picture private or whatever. <laughs> but just keep in mind, especially social media at your workspaces, I've fired, uh, I've personally, a coworker of mine was fired because she posted a picture of herself at work um, on social media and she was friends with half the office. And that's not, like, that wasn't allowed uh, per the company policy. You can't post any pictures um, on the job site, which happens to a lot of people, especially if you're working for a federal contractor like I was or anybody that has um, some kind of proprietary information that they don't want out you know there's a lot of places that you can't do any kind of social media posting at work so that's another thing to keep in mind if you're if you're out you know trying to sneak something it usually gets found out through social media unfortunately <laughs> so there are some stories i can tell i know someone who worked for someone and they had a rat basically it was a profile that uh, I think his boss made, and it was a profile of some generic, like, really hot girl with really basic information, and he sent friend requests as her to a bunch of the people that worked there, and being guys who didn't think with this brain, they all accepted, and several of them were uh, either reprimanded or fired for things they had on social media. Mm -hmm. Don't put it out there unless you want the world to know that it's there. Yeah, it's, it's pretty basic stuff, but people don't really think about that. Um, and it's been mentioned before, but social media is play, plays a lot different role than it did 10 years ago or even five years ago. Um, so check not just your not just your Facebook or your Instagram, but like your Snapchat and all that other stuff. Like there's all these other profiles out there, even your YouTube stuff. I mean, that's out there. People can see it. So keep that in mind. I would review all of your social media outlets, even ones that you haven't touched in a long time, because those are probably the ones you want to look at the most yeah. for sure. <laughs> So another thing that I wanted to bring up is when you're, um, a lot of people don't know when to follow up with an employer once they've submitted their resume or their application. This um, is, cr I think this is, can be super important, um, can really help or really hurt you because I've had someone call me every day, sometimes hourly, which I, it's really a form of harassment. So, so let's talk about some reasonable follow-up timelines and when to expect your application to be reviewed or your resume or any kind of feedback. All right. So the first thing I would mention is when you, before you apply to a job, look at when the job's going to come offline. If you're applying online, if you're turning in a resume, you should ask the person at the front desk, when should I hear back from somebody about this? When's a a reasonable expected time that I would know something one way or the other about my application. Okay, those are two super important things. P most people are just so nervous, like they're turning in their application with their hands shaking. <laughs> don't, don't be that nervous, it's okay. But you do wanna ask before you start calling the next day, because I guarantee you, usually nobody has touched it within 24 hours. Um, I It was a personal, um, 
way that I worked, I didn't look at any resumes or any applications until the job had completely closed. So I didn't look at them a few at a time. It's easier as a recruiter if you're screening applications or resumes. You do it all at one time because all those, whatever I'm looking for, those requirements are fresh in my mind. I'm not looking. I don't have to go back three or four times and make mistakes on applications. So most people do it that way, I would, I would assume. So if I were you, I wouldn't worry about it. Uh, I'd give it at least five business days after the job has closed. So if it closes on a Friday, I wouldn't be looking to hear anything from anybody till at least the following Friday or Monday, right? So you want to give them at least five business days to take a look at applications. Um, with welders, there was thousands. I would have to go through thousands and people who are out there that just click apply to all and they apply to everything out there. I've got to get through all those jerks till I get to you who is an actual qualified person. So um, it takes time. It takes a lot of time and I'm one person with thousands of applications. So five business days um, is pretty reasonable and sometimes people need more than that. So don't get too frustrated and don't feel like that's a hard deadline. I guess you may want to ask and kind of feel that out. But I would at minimum give people five business days. Um, if you have heard from somebody about uh, an interview and maybe you've gone to the interview and you want to know like when do I know if I'm going to get the job. Um, that's another big thing that I've been asked about a lot. So you can ask that question in the interview. When do you think I would hear back from you on that? Um, if you don't hear back from that person on that day, whenever that day is that they gave you, um, it is reasonable to follow up with an email after 48 hours of that specific day. Sorry. It's okay. <laughs> that specific day. Follow up with an email. That doesn't mean call. That doesn't mean leave five voicemails. That means just send an email, a nice articulate email. Hey, I I really enjoyed getting to know more about the company the other day. Uh, I look forward to being part of your team. When do you think I would hear something about the decision, right? That's pretty fair. Um, if they don't respond to that email, it's because they're probably still working through who's getting hired. Um, and sometimes if you're not the first selection, maybe you're the second, they're working through the first selection, he declines, he or she declines the job. You've got to give that time, that process to play out before they are going to call you. So sometimes that could take a couple of days. So just you've got to be patient in the process. A lot of people say, well, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. No, the squeaky wheel is annoying and nobody wants, nobody wants to deal with that. It's a bad first impression. Um, I, unfortunately, I literally had to tell someone if they called back again, I was going to have to call the police on like harassment. It was crazy. This person like called every day, left me lots of voicemails. Uh, at the time, I was working 22 different jobs, so I had the interview process, resumes, applications, hiring a person wow. 22 different times, right? So over 22 different jobs, I've got a 1,000 plus applicants I'm working with all the time. Mm -hmm. So recruiters and HR, I mean, I know that it looks like they're just paper pushers and not really doing anything. They're doing things, I promise you. Um, and we want to get the job done just as quick as you want the job because the sooner I close that thing and move on to the next job, the better I look to my boss. So don't assume they're, they're just like playing solitaire somewhere or like Candy Crush um, all day. They're not, I promise you, they're not. So give them time, but I would follow up with an email first and then a phone call if you still haven't heard anything. It's totally reasonable, but five, three or five business days is always a good rule of thumb before you do one or the other. I always recommend an email first because they can respond to you over a period of time when it's feasible. Um, if you still haven't heard, a phone call is perfectly appropriate. People do take vacations. People have sick time. They have kids who are sick. They have family members who are ill. So all kinds of life things happen. So it's easy to forget that there are real people back there. <laughs> so try to remember that, guys and girls. Um, give those people a break a little bit. But follow up is totally fine, just not uh, in a harassment form would be better. <laughs> yeah, I would. You know, it's a really fine line it because is. neediness is never attractive in any situation. But on the other hand, it really is a good idea to follow up on things like this. You just you don't want to go overboard with this. Be intelligent about how you go about it. Yeah. The interview process, it's, it's hard um, and everybody's nervous. Uh, and there, that's, I always recommend that you ask questions during an interview. Um, you know, I think that's a great way to end the interview, being able to um, show like you have some kind of thought process while you're there. You're not just giving somebody lip service like, yes, I'm the best thing ever. Hire me. 
people want to hire you because of your brand, right? Because of who you say you are. So you have to be who you say you are. <laughs> so if you're on time, you need to be on time. And I, the only way I know that is looking at what time you got there on your interview day. Mm -hmm. So the person, when you walk in and you check in for your interview, they write down what time you get there. Trust me, 100%. You may not see it, 100% they write down what time you get there. And I look at that right before you walk in the room. I'm look, I review your resume and then I review what time you got there. So if you tell me you're on time and you showed up two minutes before the interview, I'm gonna notice, right? I'm gonna notice like that doesn't correspond. If you look dirty, if you look like you just rolled out of bed, if you look like you just got off uh, a really good cigarette, right? I'm gonna be able to tell, like I can tell all those things and that speaks to your character, that speaks to your brand. Are you gonna buy like a dirty iPhone? No right? Nobody would. I'm not. I'm not buying some cheap used things. So I'm not, I'm not looking for that from an employee either. So those are all stuff uh, to keep in mind. Yeah, I would advise that you take a good, hard, brutally honest look at yourself and say, would I hire me? Yeah. I don't know. If I'm sitting on the other side of that desk and I walked in, what am I going to think? And don't show yourself too much mercy doing this, thinking like, oh, you know, that guy's shirt's all wrinkled up and stuff. Get another shirt. Oh, this guy, you know, he's not you know, I want him to take a weld test, but there's no way he's welding in that. You know, even if you're a broke high school kid going through a welding program, go, go to Goodwill or something and get one of these for 2 or $3 or whatever. Just figure it out so you look like you're actually ready to be in this position and just you, like you have everything together and you're actually ready to go and you're actually ready to do this. Yeah, writing stuff down is another easy way to kind of help relieve some of that like mental stress about you know, are they paying attention to the way I'm sitting? Do I, am I sitting right? Do I look like I'm engaged? You know, sometimes you get, we kind of all get in our own heads about things like that. It's hard to get through an interview if you're not a good representation of yourself. That can be very stressful. So I always recommend writing things down. Um, questions that you may have, like what kind of benefits does this job come with? Uh, I think another great question is to ask the interviewer, like what do you like most about this company? What do you like most about your job? What can I expect here every, on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, how am I being evaluated? Like how, what's, you know, what's the promotion system like? So those are all great questions to ask in an interviewer that shows that you're engaged and you're conscious of what's going on. You're thinking ahead as if you've already gotten the job, which is a great way to think. Mm -hmm. um, assuming that you already have it without being pompous about it is great. And those are all good questions to ask. Um, it's hard, it's easy to forget that stuff. So I always tell guys and, and girls to write it down. When you come in with paper, with stuff already written about the company, talking points, whatever it is, that's great. It looks, you look super prepared, you look super thought through. Um, I love that, I, I always give somebody a plus sign on their resume when I see that, it's a big bonus. Um, it's a good sign that you've thought through what you're doing. This isn't just something that you're kind of flying by the seat of your pants about. This isn't a job just to get you somewhere. Mm -hmm. So in a year you can quit because it's expensive to yeah, hire people. Nobody wants to, to have you there for a year and then turn around and leave. Um, I think we talked about in the last video how much it actually costs to hire somebody. It's, most companies, it's more than, several, more than a couple thousand dollars to hire someone when you talk about the paperwork and the training, all the consumables that come into getting you there as an employee, new PPE, et cetera, et cetera. It's expensive. Nobody wants you there if you're only gonna be there for six months. They mm -hmm. want you there because you're gonna be there a long time. So giving that idea that you're prepared, this is the decision that you've made, this is the company you really wanna be a part of, that's how you display that, by having questions uh, for the employer when you're in the interview is great. It's a great way to show that, so. All right. Good. Yeah, I was going to add something there, but I forgot what it was. Dang it. I know. That's the worst <laughs> thing ever. Okay. Cover letters. Um, this is something that I look forward to Sydney's input on because I perceive this as one thing that could be very useful or very detrimental if you go about it wrong. So a cover letter is, I would describe, I mean, she's our resident expert here, but I would describe this as if I was, if I was in the market for a job and I was going to send in a resume to a company, I would sit down and actually write a personalized, you know, so this is, this is how I ended up in this position to be applying for a job at your company. You know, originally, I, uh, the joke is that nobody actually wants to be a welder. Everybody wants to do something else and they get into welding and they love it and they stay in it. I've not met that many people who's actually, when they were like nine years old, they're like, I want to be a welder. You know, like my background, I wanted to be a uh, tractor mechanic. Shouldn't be too, bi too big of a surprise to most of my regular viewers. And uh, that, that's what ultimately led me to welding. And at the time, the job market for welders was a lot better in the area that I was living. So I'm like, 
all right, I guess I can do this. And here we are. <laughs> so what I might, the point of all this is I might say, look, you know, ever since I was a child, I was passionate about working on this type of equipment. I really thought this is what I wanted to do with my life. But X, Y, and Z happened in very short form. No one really cares about your whole life story here. And I ended up uh, going down the path which led to welding. I, I, this isn't really something I'd ever thought about before, but it's something that I was like, you know what, I can do this. I really enjoyed it. It's a way for me to express X, Y, and Z about myself. You know, uh, if I like to build things, I don't really like to do artistic stuff. Maybe if, you know, some of you guys do, I know that's popular, say it's an avenue for metal art. I'd say, you know, I really like making things and fixing things, and that's what I like about this. You know, my background, as you'll see on the resume, is I graduated from X, Y, and Z in an X month of Y year. And uh, the reason why I want to work at your company is my great uncle Larry's dog babysitter. You know, his brother works there and he absolutely loves it. He talks about how well they, you know, they treat their employees and they do this, that, and the other thing. And I'm looking for a real career in this. I don't want to just show up and be barely functional welding car mufflers or something. I want something that I can actually stick with for a while. Uh, you know, I want a job that provides me with X, Y, and Z, helps me to accomplish my life's goal of, uh, you know, whatever it is, stable income to raise a family, honing your skills, you know, uh, maybe you want to be a CWI or something, so you want to get a few years experience, what, whatever it is, just say, this is me, this is how I ended up here, this is why I want to work for you guys, and this is what I have to offer you, and this is what I want to do with it. But uh, what would you look for in a proper, in a proper cover letter? Because you're the one who actually has to evaluate all these things when they come in. Different recruiters like and look for different things. Um, so again, this is all, um, this is based on my experience in a, in a federal contracting, like ship industry, shipbuilding industry, um, which I think a lot of times that's it's same, uh, same type of experience across recruiting in general, but some people don't read cover letters at all. Some don't, some people don't care. They flip right past it. Some people spend a lot of time reading what's in there and then what you didn't put in there. So that's, a cover letter is a great way to, to kind of set the premise for who you're going to be in your interview. Um, so if you're talking about forward thinking in your cover letter, I think that's the best way. And what I mean by forward thinking is your goals, you know, like this is what I've done because this is what I, this is where I'm planning on going. If you want to be a CWI and you want to let, you know, you need the experience and time to do that because you want to use that CWI to better contribute to the company. There's your perfect, there's the yep. perfect place to sell that yep. is right in your cover letter. So then when you get to your interview, because I guarantee you stuff like that gets you an interview, when you get there, that's a talking point for the interviewer, which that makes it super easy, right? And you can go back and forth about it. The things that you don't want in your cover letter, which is a whole lot easier to talk about, do not, do not by any circumstance, badmouth somebody or talk about a former employer or talk about a former, um, company that may have done you wrong that you feel like one way or the other has you know mistreated you possibly you're showing what an upstanding um, man or woman you are and that's not the place and that's not how you do it so um, it's it's a super big red flag if I read something about you know I hated my last employer I didn't get along with so and so uh, I don't feel that they treated me well if you're trying to like justify where you are right now in your life we can tell that in a cover letter so it's not about what has happened to you in the past it's about this is like be objective this is what I've done this is where I'm trying to go that's what your cover letter should be and it should somehow correlate to this company and why you want to use what your goals are for this company. I think that's the easiest thing to think about, like a general broad idea in a cover letter. But some people don't write them. Um, tradesmen a lot of times don't have a cover letter. Depending on the employer, some people don't really care. Some people do care. So if you, I don't think it's ever a bad idea. Too much is more uh, is better than not enough. So yeah. if you write a cover letter, I think that's great. Uh, it gives somebody something to read, something that gives me a really good idea of, who, what kind of person you're going to present to me in the interview. But we're looking for not only what you've written, but what you haven't written. So think about those types of things. Uh, I always would tell people, have your mama read it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because she's going to be, um, sometimes they're really good at, at kind of phasing out what you're, um, what you've put in there. If it sounds derogatory in any kind of way, uh, if you sound pessimistic about yourself, you don't have a lot of confidence in yourself, that would be, um, they're kind of, they're good about being able to see through stuff like that. So girlfriends, moms, um, anybody else, your dad is probably another really good person if they've had any kind of management experience. Anybody you know with management experience, a lot of times those people will really understand what, what's in a good cover letter, but it's just more about who you are, where you've come from, and how you want to use that for the company. That's what goes in a cover letter. 
All right, now speaking of resumes and cover letters and the like, if a person has prior job experience and perhaps was not the best ending job experience, <laughs> you know, would you say it's better to, you know, obviously because of what we just talked about, you don't want to be like, I worked at X, Y, and Z welding shop and they hired a new boss and he was this, that, and the other thing. And it was absolutely terrible. And like, I wanted to murder him with a chipping hammer and all this stuff. And this or that person kept screwing with my tools and whatnot. You know, it's probably best to word that more along the lines of, uh, you know, this was my first job. I worked here for 17 months and I was looking forward to uh, expanding my skills into this or that machine that they have that I wanted to learn to use or something along these lines, you know, just or how to make or do whatever, you be a little creative. But unfortunately, the company went through a management change and there was some turmoil afterwards and now I'm better off um, pursuing my goals of learning or doing whatever or furthering my career in another direction, which is what led me to this opportunity at your company. Something along, how would you word that somewhat eloquently? Yeah, it's tricky. I get that question a lot. I've had that from a lot of students. You know, I've had all kinds of situations. I've heard some horror stories about previous jobs. <laughs> I totally understand. I mean, this is like, these are tough situations in life that nobody really knows um, because every one of them are different. But if you've had a, any kind of disagreement with a firm, former employer, whether that's a person or, you know, you didn't like the company in general, how they treated employees, the working conditions sucked, et cetera, et cetera. Like, there's a lot of that out there. There's way more out there about that than there are about the good ones, the good employees, because those guys never leave anyways, so that's how you know. Um, but how to word that is tricky. I try to get, uh, I try to talk students into not really bring, not really acknowledging it. Um, so saying like, I, you know, wanted to take a different direction. I felt like I had um, reached my peak there and I wanted to try my That's skill good. set. Yeah, I wanted to try my skill set somewhere else. So, th you know, there's try not to bring it up at all if you can. Sometimes they're going to ask, you know, have you ever had a conflict with a previous employer or a previous employee and how did you handle it? I mean, you're going to have to talk about it. Yeah. Uh, what I mentioned that like, I got in a fist fight with my last foreman. Probably not. Like, I'm going to try not to talk about that. No. <laughs> but some people do. Uh, I don't think it's it's good. It shows that you don't really have a lot of self-control and you don't handle yeah. uh, confrontation well, which is not good as a welder because you're going to be working with other people, mm -hmm. um, which is the same thing with electricians, with HVAC, with any other trades, really. You're working with people. So yeah. I try not to bring those things up. Try to spin it in a different direction. So whether you have felt like you've reached, you know, the highest you're able to go there, yeah. perfectly acceptable. People understand that. If you're really at odds with your boss, if your foreman or, um, you know, half hat or whoever it is, is just super, is just a jerk. And you really don't think like, I'm never going to get promoted on this guy. He hates me. I hate him. That's a great way to articulate that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's a great way to say, like, I just didn't think I was going to get any further in that particular job. So uh, I heard great things about this company and I yeah. think I might be a better fit here. That's another easy way to say, you know, I, w I don't think I fit in well. Sometimes that's kind of hard. So I try not to really talk about that. Just yeah. keep it objective that, you know, you're, you're trying to move up. You're trying to expand your skill set. You're trying to be a better person. You're trying to grow professionally. So if you keep that in mind in the way that you word it, you know, I'm, I, wanna, I wanted more experience in this. And I know that you have that particular machine here. Or you guys work on this project. I, that took my interest more than what we're doing at my current job. Uh, and I see longevity here where I didn't mm -hmm. see a good career path for me at this former job. See, you're never really discussing yeah. <laughs> all the bad stuff. And I mean, like it happens. I've it worked does. under, I've worked under some really nasty people, some very selfish bosses. Um, and you can't talk about that, unfortunately, or it reflects poorly on you. So being able to navigate around that uh, is really where you get kind of business savvy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, and it's, it's adulting 101, yeah. you know, not, not talking bad about other people. It's being diplomatic. Super. And I don't mean to say, like, no matter what, you need to stick it out at whatever job, no matter how yeah. horrendous it is. And that's not the point Sydney's going towards either. But, you know, if I was like, you know, I worked at this place and it was an absolute death trap. It's a miracle those morons even managed to keep the lights on in that dump. <laughs> this does not sound good. Saying, um, you know, I didn't, I felt like I had reached my peak there. I wanted to explore other options because the place was a death trap. I wanted to explore other options and um, I was not entirely sure about the long-term feasibility of staying there and I wanted to come here instead. This sounds so much better. Some people... Anyone who's ever worked retail, 
in any capacity or food service knows this. Some people are just, they're, they're problem people. They are never happy. They always whine. They complain. They invent drama. It's like it just follows them around. I do not want these people near. I'm not hiring anyone if they give me that impression. And I would be amazed if you would. I don't think that's what you want either. And uh, you don't, you don't want to give off that vibe. So if you can be diplomatic about this, then uh, that's, that's really going to be better for everyone involved. Yeah, and watch out for those people when you first get to your job um, mm -hmm. because the guy who, or the girl, <laughs> um, who pulls you aside and like, here, let me give you the download about all these people. This guy sucks. This guy is, you know, he's a jerk. And this one, like, he always, he's always on his phone. Or watch this one. He takes 500 bathroom breaks and he never comes back. If that person has pulled you aside to tell you all these things, they're probably, number one, doing it themselves. Um, they're probably not a good team player because they're throwing everybody else in their team under the bus. They're probably the most miserable employee there. And you don't want to associate with that person on your first day on the job. I'm not saying you like, well, man, get away from me or whatever. You know, like if you want to entertain that, listen to it, fine. But that doesn't necessarily mean that I would follow whoever's opinion that is. Yeah. It doesn't, it's not necessarily legitimate, valid or true. Um, but anybody who's willing to pull you aside and get you in on gossip in your first week, month on the job, it's like the worst person to be around. Please yeah. don't hang around that person. Please don't associate your, don't go smoke breaks. Don't take lunch. Don't do any of that stuff with that person. I would keep some distance there for sure. I see that a lot, that it, it gets people really started on the wrong foot and they kind of go in this downward spiral from there with their attitude towards their foreman, with their attitude towards the company, with their attitude towards their team. That person gets in there, they're miserable and they actively recruit other people to be miserable too. So get away from those people. If they don't have a good attitude, get away from them be the first person i always like i used i was a big bj penn fan right mma I have no idea who okay i'll smile and nod oh gosh okay well anyways <laughs> okay so if you if you watch ufc at all uh over the last 10 years you probably remember bj penn and he was amazing he would always say be first be first he was like um insinuating like be the first guy to hit right in the, when you're in the octagon but i think that uh that applied to me in my military experience i got told that and i think it was a great piece of advice and i've used it at work too if they're looking for volunteers be the first person mm -hmm. if they say it's time to clean up be the first person to grab a broom like be first i think that's a great rule of thumb if you're the first guy to volunteer for stuff right you hey we got to stay late i'm good i'll stay late whatever if you can if you have a family i totally you know everybody has concessions about that but being the first guy when you're the new guy it's a way to get in really yeah. well it's not brown nosing it's not any of those things it's trying to be a good employee and good employees get promoted so yeah. if anybody else has a problem with that they can't see like if they're still in high school years and they're like oh man all you do is kiss up i you know always volunteering no bro that's who's getting that's who's getting the first promotion yeah. trust me i've been on many review boards i've seen many promotions where this guy, the first thing they talk about is like, he's always the first to stay late. She's always the first one here in the morning. She's always the first one to stay late. She's the first one back from lunch. He's the first one to help clean up. He's the first one to volunteer for hard stuff. Dude, hard stuff is like, that only makes you a better person. If anybody else has a problem with that, that's not who you need to be around. Trust me, that was true in high school. It's true as an adult. Unfortunately, there's still people out there with that high school mentality about brown nosing and stuff like that. Like we're all adults, man. This is my livelihood. Like I don't really care if that's what you think. Yeah. I want to get paid. Like yeah. I'm, this is my job. This is what I'm here to do. This is adulting. This is in high school. We're not trying to like make friends and get in clicks and like, you know, form your own inner gang within the crew. Like it's ridiculous, but I've yeah. seen it happen oh, a yeah. lot. So it, it does happen. It's out there. Be prepared. And you got to ask yourself, why am I going to this place? You know, one of the best things I ever heard, one of my best friends from trade school always used to say, stupid games win stupid prizes. Mm -hmm. This is kind of like with the gossip and the clicks and everything, you know, is that really what you're going there for? Or are you going there to weld? And you say, oh, well, you know, I got to work with these people. I might as well make friends with them. All right, that's valid. Do you want to make friends with the with the gossip crew and, and the people on this side of the room who don't like the people on that side of the room because of X, Y, and Z reasons? Or would you rather make friends with, you know, someone who works like you, who gets along with you? Just avoid all that stuff, have nothing to do with it. It's not attractive to an employer. It's detrimental to productivity. There really is nothing positive that comes out of it. And the other thing is... People who actually have that drive to work hard and genuinely be go-getters, like what Sydney's talking about here, that is really, really rare. Here's how I look at it. Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah, if you're going to work, 
you are at work. I mean, it sounds obvious, but let's think about this. You're there for six or eight or ten hours, whatever it is. You're not going to be at home playing video games or watching TV. You're there, so you might as well make the most of it. And how do you make the most of it uh, in terms of getting yourself promoted and getting a better career, gaining more experience. A lot of the time, just plain and simple, making more money and being the best tradesman you can be, you actually make an effort and you actually do stuff. You don't sit around and do the bare minimum. Like I said, your, your day is over. You're not, doing, you're not doing much else when you're there. So you might as well hit it as hard as you possibly can and, uh, and get everything out of that that you possibly can. It Really, it's an investment in yourself because that way if something happens to the company, if you have to move on, you can say, you know, I was there for three years and, uh, you know, in only three years, I learned this whole long list of things. I did this whole long list of things and now you're in a position to uh, get a better job the next time around wherever you go as a replacement for that company. You know, if you do these things, you might be the guy that ends up with the forklift certification as well, whatever. Yeah, you're not really making all that much money, but if the company goes under, you go to the next job. By the way, I have a forklift certification. These other 30 people who applied for the welding job don't. Correct. So if you hire me and there's some stuff that needs to be moved, that's just an added benefit. You are getting more out of this. Don't say, because there are people with a toxic mentality, oh, well, we're getting the same wage anyway. It doesn't matter. Yeah, it does. And if you put more into this, you will get more out of it. Yeah, there's a great uh, quote that I put on our Instagram a little while back, and it says if you're willing um, to do more than you're paid one day, you're going to get paid to more than you do, right? Yeah. So I think it's a cool quote. It reminds me a little bit to think um, in, in, the mil in the military, specifically in the Marine Corps, we always had a saying to think about, um, you should think as the next rank up. So if you're yeah. a Lance Corporal, you, they want you to think like a corporal. So what would, what would uh, if I'm just a crew member, what would my half hat do? Or what would my foreman be thinking about? What are they doing? You know, thinking about it from the top down is a great way to uh, figure out. Uh, it's a good way to figure out what initiatives you could take. Yeah. Um, you don't want to get hit with like good initiative, bad judgment. Sometimes that sucks. But um, but if you're still taking initiative, like that stands out. I think that's great. Anybody who's been a boss before and you've got some kid, even if it's like, <laughs> even if it's totally wrong, the fact that you tried to step ahead is awesome. Um, mm -hmm. And everybody respects that. Every every leadership person, everybody in management would rather have somebody who's always thinking ahead and trying to get ahead of of what needs to be done way better than somebody who's dragging the team down who you've got to like constantly get behind and motivate or figure out what their problem is or you know what there's always a home life situation that's interfering with their ability to work there's always a sob story they're always in the smoke pit whatever it is like there's always an issue with that person nobody the, that guy doesn't stand out promotion time that that guy doesn't stand out when it comes time to um, for bonuses or raises or any of that stuff they're thinking about the guy who constantly put in effort from you know hour one to hour 10 or hour eight or however long you're there every day Th those are the guys they're thinking about if you're right up under that foreman trying to figure out what he's thinking about what he's doing what's the big game plan how do I help you know thinking about what your place and that and how you contribute to that team and that company dude that's like that's every employer's dream and it sounds so basic it sounds so normal but these basic normal things we're only saying them because they don't exist anymore yeah. the number one complaint we hear from employers now is I can't get them to pass a drug test or to be on time like the two most basic things they cost you nothing like I'm saving you money by being drug free like <laughs> It. and it doesn't cost you anything to be on time but they're the two biggest problems among any employer in the United States that's not Georgia that's not Texas that's everywhere in the country everybody has a complaint about younger generations being able to pass a drug test and being on time if you can do those two basic things like you're already ahead of the game it's yep. it's unfortunate that you have to say that out loud but it's there because we're saying it out loud over and over again because people aren't doing it. So if you're trying to get ahead and you really care about your career, you really care about who you are as a person, pay your dues when you get there. You've got to get there early. You've got to take the hard stuff. You've got to take the jobs that nobody else wants. You've got to volunteer for some of that stuff. Pay your dues. But then you have the respect of those around you and your employer. It's not you're not losing anything by doing more than what everybody else is doing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Now let's talk about um, another subject which needs to be handled somewhat delicately. If this is a person's first job and they're right out of high school, and there's machines there they don't know how to use, there's things that maybe they only did a little bit in high school, maybe they just don't have a clue. We got to figure out how to go about managing this because, you know, on one end of the spectrum, there's, oh, yeah, yeah, I could do that. This is the other thing. Never lie to an employer, especially about stuff like this. 
if I hired someone and they're like, oh yeah, you know, I can, I can run this or that machine, then they absolutely just crash the machine and it's a huge big mess. You said you know how to do this. Oh, wow, you know, I've never actually. This is not a good position to be in if you're an employee. And um, so I'll tell you guys a story. I, when I started my mobile welding business, I uh, never told my first customer that they were my first customer. I remember it was a, this is probably gonna make Sydney cringe, but what it was was an architectural firm who was making trendy houses out of shipping containers. Mm -hmm. And so they call me out. Uh, I had a, uh, an ad on a certain website. Uh, wasn't Craigslist. I never really, it, look, it doesn't really matter. It was another website. And, uh, and they called me out. You know, they, they called me on the phone like the night before and they needed something done like pretty much immediately. And, you know, I got my welding truck all together. It's looking pretty legit and everything. And I knew I, I made sure I knew how to like set up that specific welder. Obviously, I learned how to do the welds in trade school, but I was familiar with the equipment. I knew how to use it. And they're like, oh, yeah. So they tell me about the project. You'd be out here at 7 a.m. or whatever. I was, oh, yeah, sure. No problem. I'll be there. And uh, so I just showed up. I was like, all right, what are we doing? And I remember they needed a bunch of little stuff. Like there's these, these holes, I guess, where like forks go or straps go to lift these ship containers. Like they needed plates welded over those and like I think a door cut out or something and a whole bunch of little stuff. And I was like, all right, yeah, what are we doing? Uh, just take that seal, put that there and, you know, cover up these holes. All right, sure, no problem. I just wandered over to my truck, fired up the engine drive, backed up and started welding. This kind of, you know, there's a lot of, things. I mean, I guess there, there wasn't really much of an opportunity to go down the dishonesty road. But on the other hand, I certainly wasn't like, look, yeah, this is my first ever welding job. I've never done anything like this before. Are you sure you want to give me this chance? I might burn the whole place down. You, you just, I, I just tried to, you know, it's like, <laughs> if you want to be a tradesman, just be a tradesman. Like you, you kind of fake it till you make it through one job without lying or anything. And guess what? Now you've done this or that job. And this is like a lot of people who, you know, obviously I've always been more, an, more an entrepreneur than an employee. You know, a lot of people I've known who get into welding, they buy that first welder and, and they start doing jobs out of their garage or something like I used to do. They, um, you know, you only do a couple jobs. And then when someone asks you, Hey, can you weld this for me? Well, already you have a, an iPhone full of pictures of uncle Larry's barbecue you fixed and cousin Tyler's trailer you welded stuff on or whatever and now you have this experience and I don't know I guess this is getting off topic but you know what I would say I'm sure Sydney will have a lot to add to this is if you work somewhere and they they want you to bandsaw so I don't know why I'm stuck on the bandsaw for some reason but I am if they if they want you to bandsaw stuff you're like all right look I can do this will you just take like five minutes and get me started with this machine I understand the concept or you say I've never used one you know exactly like this depending on whatever the situation is or you know yeah you know or sometimes it's probably best if you just cut to the chase and be like look you know yeah this looks really fun I think I can do this our high school didn't have one of these though will you just like walk me through just this first little job like I know you have a lot of stuff to do it's, it's not gonna take much time I can figure this out for the most part just help me get started with this or is there anything I should know about running this particular machine, that sort of thing. It can save a lot of problems and it shows initiative if you actually want to learn this stuff versus just saying you know how to do it and then slowing down projects and costing the company money. That's the exact opposite. Absolutely. It's funny that you bring this up because this was something I um, I actually personally dealt with not long before I left my last employer and I uh, got assigned a new group of people to recruit. I didn't really know much about this uh, specific job title or um, I really didn't know what I was getting into, right? So something very similar to you guys getting on an iron worker or a bandsaw or any of these other heavy pieces of machinery, right? So I uh, was nervous, very anxious, didn't know what to say, didn't know what to do. I had a mentor at the company and um, who's now, uh, she's, she's been amazing. She was an awesome person. She told me that day when I talked to her about my like getting anxious about it, she said, the best thing and the easiest thing you can do is just to say, I don't know. Yes. It frees you up from so much expectation of what you're supposed to be, what you should know, what you shouldn't know. Um, and it also, some, sometimes it's a little ego stroke for the people that you work with because most people would rather show you the right way to do it than for you to get on there and screw up a $50,000 piece of machinery that, exactly, or, you know, $10,000 worth of metal or some kind of special piece or ex, ex, the horror stories could go on and on and on. In my particular case, um, I went into the um, hiring manager of the entire department and I said, hey, look, time out. Uh, I've never done this before. I don't really know what to expect. Um, I don't know a lot about all these different types of this particular job title. 
mm-hmm. can you help me? So he pulled out the, um, the company uh, like organizational chart and broke down all the different types what they did, what kind of skill sets I was looking for. I was so proficient when I left there and I earned the respect of someone who'd been in that company 30 plus years from going in there and saying, look, I'm not really sure I want to do this right. Help me figure out, like, I need to know, right? So he was able to implore all of his knowledge that he knew on me, which most people love to do. Um, They love to help. They like to share their information. They would rather do that, especially anybody who's uh, quote unquote, like an old timer. Yeah. So some of your senior uh, welders or senior management there, a lot of times they'd rather, they'd rather tell you they have so much to share and nobody asks because mm-hmm. you think that they assume you should already know. And if somebody does tell you, cause I got asked by a student not that long ago, well, what if they tell me I should have already known that? Then all you have to say is I want to make sure I know the way you want me to do it. Yes. Done. That's really good piece of cake like yeah. that's it you're ouch done like no more liability on you and these unrealistic expectations of you to perform or think about something that you're not really sure about please dear god don't cost the company money that's not how you earn a paycheck that is rule number one <laughs> of everything the yeah. only thing i could possibly add to that because that's really spot on is i don't know but i want to learn will you please show me how to do this will you please show me how this thing works Something along those lines. You don't want to look intimidated, but you want to be straightforward with this. And again, do not cost the company money, period. Never. Don't do it. It's the worst (laughs) thing you could possibly do because you're trying to earn them money, right? So if you're costing them money, it looks so bad. It's the first thing that comes up performance review time too. Like that's not something you want. (laughs) No. No, you do not want to be the guy whose first day you crashed the lathe or whatever because you said you knew how to use one. Yeah. What comes after that is, all right, that guy's a goof. Who else do we have? Yeah, right. <laughs> and it's right. on to the next guy. Right. Yeah, you want to be the guy that's like, you know, he asked old Larry Billy Bob, you know, how to use this machine. And, and old Larry is the only one who knows how to make it work just right. Now this kid can do that. Yeah, they, yeah. And they have a lot of like tips and tricks that a lot of people who've been there before. If you're asking those questions about how to work it, they're going to give you the shortcut instead of the long uh, manual answer that, could be in a book somewhere that they're expecting you to go off of. Like they know all kinds of shortcuts and stuff, like take advantage of that knowledge. And then you, not only do you develop a relationship with them, you have already earned respect because it takes humility to say, I don't know. And this is a, an ego welders and most trades jobs are very ego driven. So if you can get past that expectation, like you're supposed to know everything right now, your first job out welding or out as an electrician or whatever, they mm-hmm. don't expect you to know it all. And the worst thing I think I've seen people do sometimes is think that, you know, yeah, of course I know how to do that. Dude, like, do not go over there on YouTube for the next 10 minutes and think you know how to operate that machinery. You do not. Like, it will not work, it will not work out for you, I promise you. If it does, then you should probably be an actor in Hollywood. You probably shouldn't be in trades anymore. <laughs> My personal advice. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Yeah, there's, uh, I mean, you. it's a fine line. You have to believe in yourself, but do not get in over your head. Like with that welding job, I think I maybe had him send me pictures or something. I knew what I was getting into, and at this point I've been welding for years, so I knew I could do it. Uh, but you have to be prepared to say, I don't know how to do this. I, you know, this isn't something I've done before. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Perfect. There are, now we're going to talk about not necessarily taking the first job offer that you have, and also perhaps... Some companies have a reputation for being what is uh, what we refer to as, I'm I'm sure you're familiar with this term, as a revolving door. Mm -hmm. There is a pretty large company close to where I live, and they are a revolving door. I've been driving past this place for about two and a half years now, and pretty much every time I go past it, there's a now hiring help wanted sign out front. (laughs) It's not that big of a company. They haven't visibly expanded at all. It's not normal for them to be filling what's a fairly entry-level position for whatever it was, two and a half years or whatever. And I, uh, a girl I was once dating tried to get a job there and for whatever reason didn't. I don't remember the circumstances and she was bummed about it. It's like, that's probably because anywhere that is always hiring entry-level people, unless they're really growing fast, they're probably not retaining them for very long and there's probably a reason for this. So it's a little bit of a double-edged sword. You want to find that happy median here. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah. Uh, What would you say about this to someone looking for their first job? What to expect and what should you not walk away from? What should you walk away from? 
It's hard. Um, I, a big question I get asked a lot is evaluating different employers. Um, a lot of times our students have more than one job offer before they graduate, um, and then they come and say, Sydney, I don't know what job to take. I'm not <laughs> sure how to do this. You know, And so um, it's great. I, I like that question. I think it's very valuable that people understand how to evaluate a job. Um, and I could we could go into detail when you're a Georgia trade school student, but <laughs> <laughs> they don't get the good stuff for free. <laughs> no, right? no, I'm just kidding. I'm going to help know, you I out. Know. I'm going to help you out. So today, um, my piece of advice that I tell students is number one, just because you get a job offer doesn't mean you take it right away. Mm -hmm. um, if you have more than one job offer, I always tell people take it. If they offer you a job, take it. I don't care if you have another one. I don't care whatever. It's way easier to go back and say, hey, I've decided to go a different direction. Uh, I'm going to have to decline the job. Thank you for your time and interest than it is to call back and say, hey, is that job still available? Yes. That's horrible. And yeah. nine times out of 10, I as a recruiter have moved on to the next guy and yep. he's already taken it. So it's not available to you. Plus, if it was, you look like a jerk. Yeah. <laughs> guy or girl, you look like a jerk. So don't do that. Take the job. Always take the job. If it's offered to you, I always say take it. It's better to have five job offers than no job offers. Mm -hmm. Don't turn down jobs just because you're not sure. Go home. Think about it. Do some research. Um, the next thing I would say is look at benefits. Look yes. at long term. What do you want? What do you really want out of an employer? Most of the time, their HR department can tell you a dollar amount for what their benefits package is worth every year. Mm -hmm. So if they're offering you, one company is offering you $18 or $20 an hour with no benefits, and another company offers you $17 an hour with $35,000 worth of benefits every year, yep. look, you start adding that stuff up, you haven't even gotten into overtime. Yeah. The $17 an hour job, if you're going to use every one of those benefits, is worth way more yep. than the other one. So it's not always about dollar, um, it's not always about a dollar sign, unfortunately. At my last job, I dealt with people who would literally leave for like 50 cents more an hour to another ship shipbuilding company. It would drive me crazy. It was like, but they don't offer you like nearly what we do. We don't have, they don't have nearly the longevity of as far as um, career options and uh, production line. Like how many times you're going to get laid off from that other company versus us who has consistent workflow like it was just it was super frustrating to see people make a monumental like career change or you know company change like that over cents on a dollar it's ridiculous think about it so if you were if you were a grown man or woman you have a family you have five kids you have two kids you have no kids you want kids think about benefits because mm -hmm. it's not about you at that point it's about your family yes. if you want to travel and you don't care about benefits you're young enough, you're still on your mom's insurance or something ridiculous like that. Go travel. Take the do take the more dollar an hour job. Like do that. Yeah. But you have to evaluate you have to think about like, am I gonna use the benefits they're offering? Number one is super important. If they have benefits you're not gonna use, whether that's um like a flex spending account or union stuff or education opportunities, you're not ever gonna go back to school, which never say never on school work, but um, if you're not going to take advantage of those that maybe think about somewhere else like that's mm -hmm. perfectly acceptable But if you have more than one job offer, you're not stuck in that one job that you think you really won't use all the benefits um, And another thing to think about that I tell students is um, Your ability to last there so if I don't want to weld every day till I'm 65 years old and I retire mm -hmm. How do I move up and where can I move up the great thing about um, the shipyard that I worked for? was that you can not only move up as a welder to like a half hat and a foreman and ship superintendent, et cetera, et cetera, um, is that you can also translate into other jobs. So we hired everything there from firemen, EMT, lawyers, to, you know, we had engineers and designers to HVAC to, you know, just the list goes on and on. It's a small city within itself that you could have all kinds of job opportunities to translate into. So you're not limited to starting there as, as a welder and finishing there as a welder in 30 years. You can go into all other kind of career avenues at that company. That's worth a lot of money to people. <laughs> so that's another thing to consider as far as evaluating different jobs and what happens if I get more than one. Take both of them. And then take time out with the people that are important to you, whether that's your husband, your spouse, your partner, your wife, whoever it is, and determine your lifestyle and then how you, if that company fits in with your lifestyle. Because if benefits are important to you, you need to look at dollar amount on those and if you're going to take advantage of them. If that stuff's not important to you, you're young, you want to get out and travel. I love, uh, I love traveling. My last job, I traveled a tremendous amount. I thought it was amazing in my 20s to get out and travel the world at least the United States, I saw a lot of it. It was amazing. It was cool. Um, I, I don't have that opportunity 
anymore. And I'm so glad I took advantage of it then. Once people start having families, that opportunity is not really, it's not really feasible. And that's okay. Everybody understands that. But if that's not your thing, go do it. Go travel. Yeah. Take a few dollars more an hour. Get out there. Bust your tail in and work, work all the overtime you can get. Save money so when you're ready to start a family, you have that nest egg. But don't take a job like at a local fab shop. Yeah. And wish you hadn't. <laughs> yes. I would add to this one thing I've noticed in welding, a trend, uh, which both of you guys know about, is most people, I'm not saying it doesn't happen, and I'm certainly not saying there's a thing in the world with doing this if you choose to. Most people I personally know who got into welding don't actually weld forever. They weld for like five or 10 years. Then, hey, guess what? You know how everything in the shop works. You know how this place runs. I want you to be our next supervisor. Mm -hmm. I want you to get into management. Or, you know, like uh, someone poaches them away to go into sales because they say, you know, you've been running this type of welder for half a decade now. You know how these things work. We, we need you to go over there and sell these to those companies. They get into management. They get into sales. They become a CWI. Mm -hmm. Most people don't actually weld indefinitely. Now, I know plenty of older people who have, but for every one of those, there's probably five guys who started their own business or went down one of these other paths. So having these doors open, even if you're watching this here in trade school, welding is your favorite thing in the entire world. You know, working outside in 110, 120 degree summers, you do five or 10 of those, that management position might start looking good. So if you thought of this when you signed on with the company and you chose to go with the company, even though it pays 50 cents an hour less, you know, you have these doors available to you. That is worth something, definitely. Yeah. And another thing I would add, maybe do you have anything to add on to that? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Okay. Is avoiding revolving door companies. Uh, there's a lot of reasons why a lot of people do not stay at these companies. Perhaps some aren't the company's fault. Perhaps some of them are. You know, wh whatever the case is, you want to protect yourself from this. The overwhelming theme in this video, the one thing I'd like to point out most of you guys have caught on to, we're telling you how to be the best, you know, employee that you can be. And you think, oh, well, you know, I don't just want to be an asset for a company. Really, it's in your best interest to do these things and be the best employee that you can be. Because we're saying, you know, you want to do this and that and the other thing for the company. Really, what we're saying is you want to do this for yourself. So that way you can get a better job next time or if something happens, you're really making an investment in yourself. The added benefit is for the company who's paying you. Um, so... Revolving door companies, one thing I was always told is see if you can look around the place and if you have a chance to talk to some people, find out how long they have or haven't been there. One of the channel sponsors uh, is probably one, in fact, I think they've actually been rated one of the top companies in the entire country to work for. Definitely the top in their state. They have like, uh, well, I don't want to give too many details, but if you have a job there, it's a pretty good gig. And I know one lady there who is basically her first real job ever, and she's still there after all these years and still loves it. This is the opposite of, of a revolving door company. This is where you want to be. I would say if you hear stories like that, that's probably a pretty good deal. Uh, but likewise, if you walk in there and there's a bunch of people who, you know, they graduated a couple classes ahead of you, maybe you even recognize some of them from school, and there's no one there who's, you know, been there more than a year, that's probably a little bit of a red flag. But I don't really know too much about this. Would you have any input to avoid these situations? Because again, we have to look out ultimately for ourselves. Yeah, revolving door companies, there's a lot of them, um, and for a lot of different reasons. Sometimes it's a particular um, like shift leader or crew team member or whatever. There, sometimes it's dependent on the person. Sometimes you've got to consider the source. Maybe the person themselves is just a disgruntled employee. They're never really happy anywhere they go, whether that was Taco Bell, McDonald's, KFC, <laughs> and then all of a sudden they ended up a welder. Like yeah. some of those guys, some people are just never happy. To yeah. avoid those types of things, you can kind of see signs of that when you walk in for your interview, and that's looking around the room at how old people are. Yes. I think that's always a dead giveaway when you have a lot of young people there um, if you've talked to anybody that's been there over five years, that question that I mentioned about asking in the interview, what do you like most about your job? What do you mm -hmm. like most about the company? Why are you still here? Sometimes that can help you like give some kind of discernment whether or not they really love the company or not. Disgruntled people uh, aren't very good at hiding that. Yeah. <laughs> no, 90% of the time, they're not good. If they're not happy there, it shows in some form or fashion. You know, uh, I was in a store the other day actually buying stuff and uh, they had the earpieces in, right? And so as I'm talking and we're discussing a product that I want to purchase, 
she stops me and says, hold on just a minute. Oh, am I supposed to do that plus this? And then like just gets really snotty with this person, whoever this person is, right? My opinion is not, um, she, I'm sorry, let me finish. So she like stops her conversation through her earpiece and then resumes by saying like, I'm sorry, some people here just get really, um, get really, uh, what was it, ego driven or whatever, like they get power hungry. Okay, look, I don't care who... I don't care that person, whoever their boss is, may really be that way, but I don't think that about them. I think I think poorly of the person who's telling me this, right? So if you're in an interview and you hear other people being disgruntled about the job there, yeah, that's a dead like that's easy. You can hear it. People going into the bathroom, like you know, talking or whatever, you'll hear it. You'll hear it if you get to know anybody that works there. You know, you can kind of court a company that way by by finding employees that work there. Plus, that's an easy in if they're really yeah. worth it. But I think. It's the easiest way to tell is look around the room. If, if a lot of their employees are older, they've been there a long time, they're not leaving. Yeah. So when you talk to those people, their attitude, if you ask them, what do you like most about the company? And they have very little to say, dead giveaway. I would add a couple things to that. Um, one is a smaller thing, like the place I, I mentioned, it's been a revolving door for years. It's not in my town. If I, you know, I would otherwise have no reason to be going through that area, but if I knew someone there, if I knew someone who lived in that neighborhood, you know, and, and I could say to them, look, do you know anything about this company? Oh yeah, you know, I've lived, I bought my house 16 years ago and that, for, that, that now hiring sign has been there for 15 of those years. Not a good sign. The other thing is if you can look around on the internet, you can search, um, is company XYZ a good place to work? Yeah. Employee reviews for XYZ company. Now Glass sometimes, door. yeah, exactly. Glassdoor, mm -hmm. Glass sites like that. This isn't always feasible. If it's uh, Larry Joe Bob's Corner Fab Shop, you know, and they have two employees, you're probably not going to find that much on the internet. But if you're working for a large corporation like where you used to work, I'm sure if, if anybody searched yeah. that, yeah, there's lots of that stuff. Uh, so like when I was in high school, my first job, I worked at a retail store, there's a chain, and uh, and this is what I did. And I pretty much knew what I was getting into when I when I signed up there i found out just in doing this type of internet searching that it's a pretty good deal except like i think one of the more common complaints is they have uh, essentially like a graveyard shift for for like freight stocking everything comes in on semi trucks and like in the middle of the night and things have to be put out uh and i got stuck on this shift because that's how you learn you know where things go in the store and i, I had to be at work at like 4 or 5 a.m or whatever it was and a common complaint was the shift exists and you don't get paid more for it. it's like okay well you know fine whatever and, and so I knew what I was getting into and it, it can preserve, it can prevent a lot of problems from happening mm -hmm. and it can make you aware of general themes and things to look out for at the company. Yeah. And sometimes revolving door jobs are not bad if it's your first job. Um, if you can retain a good attitude mm -hmm. despite revolving door companies usually have a lot of poorly, uh, poor, poor work workers in there and they usually all have a bad attitude. If you can abstain from that and take the job just because you're having a hard time, some people are not good at representing themselves like I've mentioned before. If that's you, you don't do great at interviews. This is the one place that offered you a job even though you know it's probably not the greatest company. It's your only option, take it and at least use it as a stepping stone, right? Yes. Because your first job in your new industry, whether it's welding or anything else, is the hardest job to get. Always, yeah. by far. If I'm changing industries, if I'm in HR and I'm trying to move over to graphic design, like that's going to be tough for me because I have no real mm -hmm. experience, applicable stuff that actually correlates with the job I'm trying to get. It's hard. It's hard. If you're 35, 42 years old, you're starting over, you're starting a new career, you decided to get into welding, that's tough. Number one, like good job, great on you for sticking to your, like what you love and what you want to do. I think that's super admirable, but the first job's just going to be hard. It's just going to be hard to get. If that's the one you have to take to like get you to the next good job in a year, mm -hmm. take it, deal with it. Sometimes yeah. you just have to put your head down and like take the bad stuff. And then in a year, know that you're going to be somewhere else. Right. I mean, sometimes that happens if a revolving door company is your only option. Maybe you need that to get your, you know, your foot in the door. Yeah. And then now that you have a little bit of welding experience, it's a little easier to put that on your resume and then build on that. Exactly. Don't, don't exempt yourself and think that you're too good to take that, especially if you're fresh out of school mm -hmm. or you're in the middle of changing, transitioning, like maybe you used to be on the road a lot if you're in a pipeline um, company and you've traveled a lot and you want to be a little more home-based and you need some of that, you know, a different type of welding experience, whatever it is. Don't be afraid to take that revolving door job. Just remember, you've got to have, you've got to retain a positive work attitude mm -hmm. because your next job will 
feed off of that. They'll know if you've been in that, oh, I see that you worked at um, that, that company. How was your experience there? Well, here we go. It's like we're back to like the yeah. interviewing stuff 101. If you have something bad to say about the company, that's not a good impression for the job that you actually want. So, mm-hmm. you know, try to remember if that's something you have to take just out of no other options, worst case scenario, bottom of the barrel, like have to have a job. It just happens to be this revolving door company. Remember to keep your attitude in some kind of positive light. Find something good to take away because that shows on your next job. Absolutely. And I would add to that by saying, you know what, especially as an entry level welder, uh, some of the opportunities you will be faced with just aren't very good. Now, I can tell you guys, I hope that, you know, you you go to welding school, you graduate top of your class, and you leave immediately making, you know, 20, 30, a million dollars an hour in whatever area you live, but the reality is that's not really feasible. Uh, this is something I talked about in another video. Where I went to school, there was a muffler plant sort of near us. They made all kinds of exhaust components for one of the big three auto manufacturers. And it was kind of a running joke with some of us that like, man, you know, you, you got to take this test again or else you're going to be welding mufflers forever. Well, let's say, because <laughs> nobody wanted this job. It was miserable work. I mean, it's I mean, nothing against people who do this, but I don't know about you guys. I don't want to make the same exact weld on, you know, 50 mufflers a day for 30 years. Mm-hmm. I don't think most people want to do that, especially after you've invested the thousands of dollars it costs to get that trade school education. But here's the thing. Uh, the issue was in that specific geographical area, there was a pretty large welding school and not much industry. The result of that is the job market was saturated with entry-level welders. So the muffler plant has a pretty much endless supply of, I think, 8 or $10 an hour. Like, I probably could have made more working at Tractor Supply, to be honest. I think it was 10 bucks an hour you started there at. Supply and demand. Yeah, exactly. Basic supply and demand. But you know what? Let's say, let's say I, I, I actually grew up in this area. Like this is where I'm based. This is where I live. This is where my family lives. I can't leave. Perhaps I have to take care of grandma or something. If that's the only option, you go there and you be the best muffler welder that you possibly can right. be. And the reason for this is simple. Let's say you take the job. It's all, you know what? That's just, it is what it is. Fine. I'll do it. You go in there with the attitude of, all right, we're going to do this. You know, uh, you know, what happens is six months down the road, you know, when grandma's out of the hospital or whatever, or whatever, and I want to move somewhere, I have this resume and it says on it that, yeah, I worked at XYZ muffler plant, but you know what? I was never late. I worked there for, what did I say? Six months. I worked there six months. I was never late. I took two sick days at the time. I had food poisoning. I thought I was going to die. It was a really bad time. <laughs> you know, I got as much out of this as I could, you know, to be honest with you, I don't want to weld mufflers. That's not why I went to school, but you know, we went there, we had this finicky older equipment. It never worked right. You know, Larry, Joe, Bob, the old timer, he's been there for 50 years. He showed me how to use this thing. So I know how to fix this old welder. You know, I know how to problem solve X, Y, and Z. I took it upon myself to learn how to run this machine. You know, they needed another forklift guy. So I got the forklift certification, never caused an accident. Superstar right there. Yeah. I'd hire you right now. Like, exactly. <laughs> this is what you want. This is the best. I mean, I think this is about the best, you know, first job ever, you know, thing you can show to who you want to be your second job the opposite if you go you know oh i don't want to weld these stupid mufflers this is the best thing ever and now what's now what's it say it says that you were late constantly or if you lie about this and they call you now you're definitely not getting hired if they call the company and ask if you were there on time Mm -hmm. you know you have this terrible attitude you did the bare minimum then you're just some loser who worked at the muffler plant for six months and got fired you don't want to be this you want to be the guy who made the best out of it that he possibly could even though it's a less than perfect situation these show excellent skills for an employee i mean I'd, I'd tell you who I'd hire right now. I mean, what really look at yourself. Which of these two would you rather have? You have to be, you know, ask yourself, like we said earlier, would you hire you? If not, think about it. Think about what you could do with this job to make you more hireable for the next one. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I think that's a great piece of advice. I mean, attitude, like making the best out of where you are. We have a, um, a poster. It's like 10 things that cost you nothing, right? And yeah. most of the things listed on there is, have to do with soft skills and like being on time, having manners, having a good attitude. They, like just basic things that you um, literally don't cost you a dime to do or to fix or to be, but people don't have, people don't obtain those skills. You get around the gossipers, you get around the people with a bad attitude and then that stuff just grows yep. and festers. So putting yourself in a good position by keeping your head down and taking those jobs and being around good people in the company, that's how you grow. I mean, exactly. you grow as a person, you grow as an employee. And if you're right, if you have to take some 
crap job just because that's all you had and you made the best of it, that shows too. I mean, we've all, everybody uh, inevitably in one point in time ends up in a situation you never planned on. It happens to all of us at some point in time, whether you're 22 or 48. People find themselves, 2008 like drops some reputations and egos hardcore because nobody thought the company would go, or the, com the country would go in recession like that. It changed a lot of people's lives. And some of you guys watched your own parents like lose their home or their job and change, you know, your lifestyle changed dramatically. While that's unfortunate, things like that happen all over the world. And if you're that person and it's your time, like you're in that circumstance that you just didn't foresee happening, like making the best out of it is all you can do, right? It's yep. only helping you. You're only growing as a person and that shows. Trust me, when you interview people, like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people, you can see through, the, like you can't BS a BSer, right? Yeah. I mean, like, yeah. so I know, yeah. I know, <laughs> I've seen them. So it's a, it shows, it's absolutely, I think that's a fantastic piece of advice. Yeah, you want to, you know, ask yourself, who gets the good jobs, the good employees? You wanna be a good employee? Be a good employee. Say to yourself, I'm gonna be the best employee I can be. I'm not gonna be late. I'm not gonna need time to study for my drug test after <laughs> I send in the resume. You know, think about these things. Be, you know, show up, wear clothes that are appropriate for the job. Don't be the guy wearing like a loose baggy, you know, monster t-shirt with a, you know, with the hat of his, of his metal band or whatever. Don't be that guy. If you want to, you know, if you want to look like a trades, if you want to be a tradesman, look like a tradesman, act like one, talk like one, you really have to play the part and just try to be the most valuable employee you can. Because again, ultimately this does benefit the company, but really it benefits you. Yep. I think you're it. That's it. Thank you. Does anybody have anything else? No. I no? Good, right? That was pretty good. That's like over an hour. Sweet. Yeah. How long it was last time. So yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Miss Sydney, for all of your advice. Yeah, and, um, you know, links to the Georgia Trade School in the description. A big thank you to them for making this video possible and uh, supplying us with Sydney's insight and knowledge, especially, I mean, someone who's hired, what'd you say, thousands of welders, literally who better to ask? <laughs> yeah, it's been a lot. I mean, that's, that company is huge. So, uh, you know, proportionately, it doesn't sound, it really wasn't that much after being there for five years, but yeah, I've hired thousands. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it, we, we probably shouldn't say the company, uh, but I was aware of them before Sydney worked for the Georgia trade school. Mm -hmm. Sydney, actually, when she was a, a recruiter, she came to visit our class in welding school. I remember seeing her there like five years ago. <laughs> And um, yeah, Scary. yeah, it was, it was, it was. Um, it it's shows you how small the welding industry is. Yeah, now, right? it's a small world, smaller in the welding world. Yeah. And uh, so she, she definitely knows what she's looking for. And now, hopefully, you guys will know um, just some basic stuff. I mean, in hindsight, it's pretty obvious. But most of us, I know, I had to learn a lot of the things in this the hard way. And now, hopefully, you guys won't have to. So go out there, crush it, do the best you can. And remember, you will get out of this what you put into it. If you want to go there and slack off, yeah, you can make ends meet, but wouldn't it be better to have a pretty awesome career? You find a lot more enjoyment and you make a lot more money at you go further in life with. So, sure. all right. Anything else to add? No, thanks for having us. I appreciate all right. your hospitality. Thank you so much. Good. Thanks yeah. for coming out.